and I'm opening the Commission on Disabilities meeting. Um, I'd like to have an audio roll call. So um, if we can have individuals uh, verbalize that they are here, Lynn Valencourt present. Penny Shaw. Mary Russo. Just members, please. Mary Russo. Present. Crystal Evans. Present. Okay. And Thank Robin Torpe is absent, correct? She is, correct. Okay. Okay. Um, so the um, first item on the agenda will be um, a review. Do we have the review of the minutes of the meetings? We do. I was not able to get the minutes completed before this meeting. So they'll be on the meeting for the next meeting. Okay. Um, so then the, uh, the next item on is the um, information for the South Braintree Square road work status update um, with Jim Arsenault. So I've, we've invited Mr. Arsenault and Mr. Thompson, the town engineer, to um, appear on the Zoom meeting tonight just to offer an update, a status update on the road work construction that will begin in South Braintree Square, as well as the shared streets grant update. And John, John's gonna be heading it up and uh, I'll, any question, further questions, I'll be here available. Thank you, Jim. Sure. Sure. So good evening, folks. Um, thank you. And I might be a new face um, for some folks, but uh, I'm the new town engineer as of July, uh, new town engineer and assistant DPW director um, for the Braintree DPW. Um, and I just wanted to give a quick update on a project that we have pending in South Braintree Square. Um, for some of you, it might be redundant. There was also a public meeting um, on uh, last Tuesday. Uh, where we presented some of the details of that. So um, again, it may be a little redundant, but um, I'll just give a quick update on some of that work. So uh, we are making changes to the intersection of Washington Street, Hancock Street, and Pearl Street in South Braintree Square. Um, we're gonna be doing some accessibility upgrades at that location and also doing some signal phasing changes at that location. Uh, and I'll describe those first because that will prob probably be the biggest change that people will notice. Um, but essentially, we're looking at changing the intersection to, um, to basically be operating a, on a concurrent pedestrian uh, phasing. Uh, so what this means is that uh, essentially, rather than having an, an exclusive pedestrian phase where all traffic, uh, vehicular traffic comes to a stop and pedestrians have exclusive access to the intersection, uh, instead, they'll be the, the the pedestrian phases will run concurrently with vehicular traffic in the same direction of travel. So under this type of scenario, um, when eastbound traffic and westbound traffic has the green lights, uh, pedestrians will be able to cross what the Washington Street North approach. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the Washington Street. Yeah, I guess it would be the north side of the intersection. And on Hancock, they would also cross. Hancock Street on the southerly part of the intersection in essentially turning vehicles have to yield to pedestrians in the crosswalk. And similarly, when vehicular traffic has the green light northbound and southbound, pedestrians would cross, would have the walk signal and would cross uh, the Pearl Street approach to the intersection and the Washington Street approach on the easterly side of the intersection. So um, this is this is a pretty common um, a common um, type of signal phasing. Uh, it, may, it might seem a little foreign to some just because it's not um, it hasn't been done. I don't believe it has been done before in in South Braintree Square, but it is very common, especially in downtown areas uh, in areas where there are pedestrians and vehicles that are um, trying to sort of uh, coexist in in the same location. So. Um, that's a, that's a brief description of the signal phasing changes. Uh, there'll also be some signage changes. Uh, we'll be installing some LED flashing signs on the, on the East Brown and West Brown approach uh, that will activate and will flash when the concurrent pedestrian phase is active, uh, which will just notify um, drivers to, to, to be cautious and that they have to yield to pedestrians in the crosswalks while turning. Uh, in addition to that, we will be removing the do not uh, the no turn on red uh, restrictions at all ve vehicle approaches. Um, and, uh, and then lastly, 
for the accessibility upgrades, uh, we'll be installing uh, what's known as APS push buttons or accessible push buttons, pedestrian push buttons at all the, at all the uh, push button locations in the intersection. And these are um, audible push button uh, they, that emit audible tones and they're also vibrotactile. And uh, in addition to that, we will also be upgrading the um, pedestrian signal heads at all approach at all uh, at all of the crosswalk locations. So rather than simply the text that says walk and do not walk, uh, you will now have a larger uh, pedestrian signal head, which when the walk, uh, when pedestrians are allowed to cross, they'll have the big white walk symbol. Uh, and then for the, um, for the um, warning phase, basically where you're, you're still allowed to cross, but it, it will flash with a flashing red hand and also with a countdown timer which will allow pedestrians to see how much time they have left before the phase changes and they should be out of the crosswalk. Uh, so those will, th those will also be installed throughout the intersection. Um, and that, again, that's a, that's a pretty brief uh, description of all the changes, but that, pr that pretty much encompasses what, what our plans are in the South Braintree Square intersection. Um, and if you'd like, I can pause there to see if anyone has any uh, questions. Uh, John, can I ask, can you provide a time frame when the, the work is supposed to commence and how long you think that will occur? Sure. So we actually have a crew scheduled um, to begin the work uh, this Wednesday. Um, and they'll, they're, they're planning to be uh, at the intersection for three days this week, installing the new equipment and getting everything prepared. They have to install a new traffic signal controller, the new uh, push buttons, and the new uh, pedestrian signals. Um, however, we're not planning on actually flipping the switch on the actual phasing changes uh, for a few more weeks. So we're tentatively uh, eyeballing November 16th for that change right now. But before we make that change, uh, we just want to make sure that we're getting the word out and giving people ample time to sort of un understand what's happening. So uh, we do plan on soon putting out um, uh, variable message boards at the at the approaches to the intersection to just alert drivers that there'll be a there'll, there'll be a pending um, pattern traffic pattern change at the intersection as well. So John, starting on Wednesday, would there be any impact to pedestrian or vehicular traffic as this this work begins, or it, nothing should change until the actual light lighting system is activated? That, that's correct. Nothing will change until the lights are activated. The only disturbance that will be there this week will be the, the you know, the physical act of the people being there changing out some of the fixtures. So um, just the impact of them having to occupy space in the intersection, they're going to have a police traffic detail with them to sort of move vehicles around. Um, so there will be a small impact in just them sort of being being out there and being in the way, but no actual operational changes to the to the intersection just yet. Okay, thank you. Um, sure. I, I do have a question, Jim. Um, on the actual traffic signal, when a pedestrian goes ahead and um, and uh, is trying to cross, say you're going from Pearl Street and turning a right hand turn onto Washington Street, um, where the two I know that the two parking places are going to be, you know, removed there. But um, the question I have is what on the actual traffic signal, when the pedestrian goes to cross in the crosswalk, is there a red arrow that indicates to the um, people that are that are driving from Pearl Street and wanting to turn that there is somebody in there, or do they have to, you know, because that that road is not a complete lineup. You actually sort of swerve a little bit to try to line up if you were turning or going on. Um, to Washington Street. So I'm just curious as if there's a, an actual red arrow that shows on the signal light. There will not. So, um, so actually cars turning right from Pearl Street will have a green, a green light. They will be allowed to proceed and make a right on to Washington Street at the same time that people crossing Washington Street have a walk symbol. So um, that's one, and, and the reason you met, like you mentioned that the, the, there is a slight skew there um, that is the reason that A, we're eliminating the parking spaces so that the vehicles turning right from Pearl Street will have a constant line of vision to the crosswalk to see any potential conflicts in the crosswalk. 
Um, and, then, um, and then also we're installing the flashing LED sign on that approach so that people approaching the intersection when the concurrent phase is active, when there are potentially pedestrians in the, in the crosswalk, they, they will have a flashing sign to notify them of, of such. And where is that sign located? Uh, it will be located on the Pearl Street approach. So as you approach the intersection from, say, coming from McDonald's into the intersection. So is there going to be, um, is there, so it's a, a flashing stop signal or a flashing, what, what does the actual sign say? Um, so the sign says uh, vehicles must yield to pedestrians in crosswalk, turning vehicles must yield to pedestrians in crosswalk, and it will be flashing. Uh, and a, is it is it a hexagon shaped sign that has a, a pedestrian crossing in it or it's just a worded sign or what kind of signage is that? It's a square sign um, and actually I think um, a picture of it was included with the agenda that that Mary Beth had sent around. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to pull this up. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, OK. It's probably backwards, but. So it's a square okay. sign with wording and uh, pictorial. All right. And that, and that happens on all of the approaches? Uh, so, like for any turn, that's a right-hand turn and, and somebody's crossing the street? So the flashing, the flashing signs will be on the eastbound and westbound approaches. Uh, we will have static signs that are basically the same, except they will not have the LED flashing for the northbound and southbound approaches. Why are we not doing all four corners? Cur and um, currently there is yield to pedestrians. No, no turn on red signs up. People don't follow those. People are constantly turning when it says no turn on red. And I sit at that intersection often 10 times a day. Mm. Um, so, so they're not even following that. So what would make you think they're gonna follow this? So, so one of the one of the reasons that um, we think that this is a good change for the intersection uh, is that one of the things that I see happening there now is that the the waits are are so long for both cars and pedestrians that I think it's leading to driver frustration and it's leading to people doing things like turning right, right on red when they shouldn't and it's leading to pedestrians jaywalking. Uh, basically a crossing crossing the road when they shouldn't because they, they right now they have to wait for the entire signal cycle which is in excess of two minutes um, for, for the pedestrian phase so on on numerous occasions when I've been observing the intersection what I what I've noticed is that um, on both occasions more more than half of the pedestrians that are approaching the intersection and pressing the uh, push button are then, simply either waiting a time and, and, and crossing before the, before the uh, crosswalk phase comes in, or they're simply pressing the button and then continuing to walk. Um, and, and more than half of the pedestrians that are, that are approaching the intersection are doing that. So um, in my opinion, the, inter in, in the intersection is already sort of in a way acting in a concurrent type of scenario because people are, people are finding the vehicle gaps in there and they're basically getting out and crossing the road during the greens uh, and cars are reacting to that. So uh, in a way it's, um, it's already sort of acting in, in that way. Does anyone have any other questions? I do. Um, on, well, on this whole thing, how long have you spent watching this intersection? Me personally? Um, probably a few hours in, in, in total. Okay. I live 300 feet from the intersection. And so, I mean, that's why when I say I'm frequently there, I've spent years watching this intersection and the people that tend to jaywalk this intersection are jaywalking to get back to a car. If you watch where people are going, because I sit there waiting the two minutes and I wait the two minutes and there's a lot of people with disabilities that frequent this intersection because South Braintree Square has a lot of disabled people because of MBTA access um, and because everything is within walking distance. We have Holbrook Ave that has several rooming houses that are almost everybody in those rooming houses has a disability and they're all ambulatory disabled. 
We also have Olympian Diner right there. And a lot of seniors will park over at Walgreens, go to the diner and then go back and shop Walgreens. It's like a thing they do. And so that intersection is constant crossing of seniors and people with disabilities. And these are not the people that are doing it. What you're seeing is people that are drivers. They're not people who don't drive, who frequent this area. So what's gonna end up happening with this is when you've got the seniors and you've got people walking with canes, it's gonna take a lot longer for them to cross and they're gonna end up holding up traffic entirely. And these are the people that frequent the intersection throughout the day, all day, every day, because they all live within a block of the square. The other issue I brought up the other night in the other meeting is around blind access. Um, blind people for years have been asking for audible signals in that intersection. You're now telling a blind person to cross when it's not actually safe to do so. Um, and I've alerted a couple of local blind residents to this issue. I've spoken to multiple residents who can't be on this meeting because the other dynamic you're getting with this, you held the meeting the other day, we've got this meeting, but a lot of disabled people don't have the money for a smartphone, and don't have computer access at home, and therefore can't participate in Zoom meetings for feedback. I've spoken to two residents specifically who have been hit by cars in South Braintree Square who are disabled. One man has been hit three times, and the more he's gotten a hit, the more prone he is to getting hit. He was crossing towards Walgreens a year ago when a car trying to make a right on red um, didn't see him because the middle lane was stopped and he ended up putting his cane through their windshield trying to stop them so he didn't get hit. Um, and these are real people's lives. This is, this is the dynamic of who's in this community. And like I said, I live right here. So I know who all these people are. I've heard their stories. You know, we sit there talking as we're waiting to cross. Yes, you wait two minutes, but like, that's how I met Penny Shaw, who's actually on the meeting, um, was constantly waiting to cross the intersection together. Um, and I feel like this is completely being left out of the picture in these decisions. Um, but then what happens is when people that are ambulatory disabled try to cross an intersection, the cars get very passive aggressive when they're taking too long to walk. I've watched people get the middle finger because they're elderly and because they're disabled and because the drivers are fed up with them. So it's like, all it's gonna do is increase the microaggressions towards people with disabilities in our community. There was a blind man in South Braintree Square who literally had a car get out and start screaming at him last year because of how he was crossing that intersection. Um, and it's like, this is a huge disability issue and this is a huge issue where we're gonna end up with microaggressions from drivers um, because of how people with disabilities are perceived. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, unfortunately, I can't speak to, you know, um, the attitudes and, the, you know, the disgusting behavior of some, um, you know, however, I can say that the changes we're, we're making, I believe, are, um, are, are net positive. Um, you know, like I said, the, the, from an accessibility standpoint, from people that are vision impaired, um, you know, the upgrades, we're actually making upgrades that I think are making the, making the intersection better, um, you know, and again, the concurrent pedestrian phasing is, is something that's very common. It's, it's, you know, it's not, it's not any more or less safe, uh, than exclusive pedestrian phasing. It's, it's a change is, is, is what it is. Um, but we feel, uh, that it will be a change that, that, it works for all users that that makes everything flow a little bit better um, pedestrians and cars as well have you looked any more into the delayed phasing where the pedestrians start walking first before the cars get the chance to turn we have and and so the the reason um the reason that the lpi cannot be implemented at this intersection uh is because of the protected left-hand turns that are, um, that precede uh, the concurrent phasing. So um, in all directions right now, uh, so the, in the eastbound and westbound directions, there is a phase where uh, those, there, there are protected left turns. So basically out of, uh, out of Pearl Street and out of Washington Street uh, westbound or eastbound rather, um, there is a phase where those two approaches will have the green arrow opposite of each other uh, to make a left. 
And then similarly in the northbound and southbound um, direction, there is a leading protected left for uh, the Washington Street southbound um, approach. So essentially what that means is that if you were to do an LPI uh, where you would be um, get it, attempting to put car, uh, pedestrians out into the intersection and give them a head start on vehicles, you would be putting pedestrians into the crosswalk during those protected protected lefts, which is which is unfortunately not allowed. Um, have you consulted Walk Boston at all on this? Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, I don't know if the previous uh, town engineer or um, the consultant has, but uh, I have not. Okay. Um I had also referenced the plastic bollards that are at the corner of the square in the last meeting um, and how they're being hit by cars that are coming up onto the sidewalk as they turn. If you're forcing pedestrians to go up to the curb cut to wait to cross because of the concurrent turning, can we get those plastic ones replaced with concrete to protect, protect the pedestrians? Right now, I know better than to go past the, the lights before that second section of sidewalk, the way it's double now. Um, a lot of us wait further back, but if we're being forced to the front to be able to cross quickly, can you protect us with bollards there as well as at the sidewalk just after the Chinese restaurant? Um, because we've got cars driving up on there as well. They're, they're parking on the sidewalk to go pick up Chinese food. Okay, um, so I can certainly look into that issue. Um, I'd have to do a little bit more research. I wouldn't want to tell you one, one way or the other. Um, now on the spot, but I can certainly look into that issue with you. But I just want to go back and address one of the things you said where pedestrians will be forced to cross quickly, and that's not, that's not the case. Um, so pedestrians will actually have more time to cross now under the concurrent phasing, just because the, the, um, the, the, the phases will be longer for, for, as the vehicles and both the vehicles and the pedestrians have the uh, you know, the, the green light or the walk symbol, so to speak. So there's actually additional time to cross. There's additional time, but the cars are turning, which changes the dynamic of what we have to do with pedestrians. Cars are turning, but the cars have to yield to pedestrians in the crosswalk. So there's more time, there's, there's more overall time to, to, to achieve the cross. <laughs> this is Penny. How do I um, use the raised hand function here? Okay, so Lynn, you need to. Uh, I can't see public it. comment. Yeah, I'm okay, I can't um, see to find it on my iPad here. Okay, so so we do have some members from the public. Um, Penny, I understand you would like to to make a public comment. Yes, if I could, please. Okay. I would like to tell you that my disability is a little unusual. Um, I don't know if you can see me, but I have Gillian Barre and it's an atypical muscle weakness disorder. My head hangs over to the right. I cannot turn my head to the left at all. So on some of these crossings, I have no ability at all to see any car that would approach me from the left. So I'm very vulnerable to being injured here, uh, which is why I've always depended on knowing by looking straight ahead, which I can do, even though my head, my head's literally on my shoulder right now. That's how far it hangs to the right. It does not move to the left at all. I can't move it that way. I think I'm extreme, personally, I'm extremely vulnerable because I can, I have very little ability to move, turn my head to see what's going on because of my disability. So uh, I'm very concerned about it. I, you know, we'll see what I can legally in the next week. If you're not, if you're gonna implement this, see what I can do to be protected. Uh, I cannot, I, I cannot be watching for cars when I can't turn my head. Um, I think Penny brings up a valid point um, because there's a lot of disabilities that can present like her spinal cord injury, um, people that need head controlled wheelchairs, um, that they have to have their head in a certain position to be able to cross the intersection and they can't turn to look. Um, like I mentioned in the last meeting, I'll bring this up again. Um, often the intersections where these are used in the city are big square intersections. Um, for instance, um, Mass Ave at um, both Albany and um, what's the street before Albany? Um, Harrison. 
both have this layout, but it's a very wide full visibility intersection where both pedestrians as well as drivers have full view of everything. And this is just not the layout of this intersection. This is what makes this dif difficult. I use concurrent crossing all the time through Boston, but the intersection layouts are very, very different. And that's what makes this so much more dangerous for people with disabilities, especially those of us sitting in a wheelchair where cars stopped in the middle lane can't see um, the drivers making a right on red won't see us because of the car in the middle lane. It's not like somebody standing. Crystal, I, I, I was in Boston this past uh, numerous times. I own, I own some property up in the north and I've gone through it numerous times. And when you're in a car, you can't even see the left you because there's so many lanes and, and it's right on red allowed in some of the locations. And right. you've got these people crossing. It's very dangerous. I mean, but what I'm saying is there's, there's a lot of the intersections don't have really good visibility. So, and, and I think in, in this particular instance, there is much more visibility than some of those huge intersections I have there where you really can't see the left. You get a big truck on your right and the left-hand side, you can't see anything. These are just either single or maybe one other car next to you. And there's typically not often having large vehicles like that. I think it's, it's a must save for intersection if you, if you my consent and my uh, my feeling so uh quick question on the um on the duration of you know the sign that's that's flashing for the people um to tell them that there's a pedestrian in the crosswalk how long does that light led light shine does it continue on for the full phase or does it stop after so many seconds it will flash for the for the entire duration of the concurrent phase I'd like to make a second comment when my turn comes also, please. Go ahead, Penny, you may make a comment. You know, think about these, from the, the meeting we had before, what I heard a lot of, see if I'm incorrect, which we were talking about the frustration of the poor folks in cars who are protected by a metal covering of the vehicle, uh, who didn't, were getting frustrated waiting so long at the intersection. Now, should there be an, imp an, an impact between a pedestrian, I use that word generally, I'm in a power chair, and a vehicle, I'm more likely to be injured than they are because they're protected. Um, and if we're doing this to, to help out the, I think it's very ableist actually, that what we're doing is we're, we're trying to accommodate mostly able, by people who can drive versus those of us who can't drive um, to, because they're getting awfully frustrated at that intersection of how long they have to wait. That's what I thought I heard. So I find it very ableist. I'm very disappointed in the commission. They have taken the wrong position on this or whatever position, I don't know what position commission members have made. Um, but any impact is going to more clarify, seriously affect. Penny, Penny, to clarify, the commission has not taken any type of position here. This is not. This is a. This is an item that's being brought forward to the commission from the um, from from the the town in order to get feedback. So the commission has not taken any type of, of position. Yeah, but on as, in, as individuals, those of you that are in charge of this meeting so far, not said anything on our behalf. I'm disappointed in you. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. As individuals represent people with disabilities, I wish you would speak up and look at the, how vulnerable we are. If, if a car hits a pedestrian, the pedestrian is more likely to be injured than the person in the car. We're very, very um, at much at risk here. I'm just disappointed that those of you are running the meeting who are on the commission are not speaking up and saying what you think. That's what I'm being Can honest. Just clarifying say. once again, I have not gone ahead and given any positions on this. I have been asking questions to gain more information about what type of signaling yeah, but you're not allowed to speak your items opinion. are there. You're not and allowed it's to not my, right now, I'm trying to gather information and, and, and the public, I've allowed, and the public is giving some comments, but I have not given any type of indication as to which, whether or not I approve or disapprove. My position is to allow people to give their comments and to try to run the meeting so that everyone gets to give their comments to Mr. Arsenault. That being said, is there anybody else who is in the meeting who would like to um, ask any questions of Mr. Arsenault or have any comments? No? 
This is Mia Russo. I, I don't have any questions right now. I just need to educate myself a little bit more about it. So I, I right now I don't have anything to ask. Um, I, I thought it sounded well, but again, I need to educate myself a little bit more about it before I can ask any proper questions. So Lynn, if I could, this matter was brought before the board as a status update to provide an update on the project that will begin. It wasn't to solicit comments from the, or either approval or disapproval from the commission. It was to provide an update to the commission. Thank you. I just want I just wanted to to let let people know that that the commission is is not functioning as the 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 uh, approving the authority gatekeeper as to whether or not this goes through or doesn't go through. We are simply here uh, as from the commission to be able to give feedback and to bring our concerns to the people that are that are looking to make have the project go forward. We, we always appreciate input from everybody and we really appreciate your comments for sure. Um, Mr. Ashno, just another, another quick question that I have. Um, you mentioned that two of the uh, pedestrian crossing signs or informational signs will have LED. Um, what is the rationale for the other two not having an LED flashing? So um, I can answer that. So. Um, essentially, we felt that the eastbound and westbound approaches were slightly uh, more skewed than, than your normal intersection. So we felt that it was appropriate to have a little bit of extra uh, notice to drivers approaching from, from those directions. However, the northbound and southbound approach are more of a typical um, alignment for a typical intersection. Uh, so we felt that the static signs are sufficient for those approaches. Um, and also, I, I, I don't actually have the diagrams in front of me. I have the, the letter of description in front of me. Um, I, I know that the two spaces that are near the intersection um, on Washington Street turning right from Pearl are going to be limited. Is there going to be limited parking on all corners by two spaces um, to clear up the intersection, specifically um, parking that comes down near in front of McDonald's? or parking that, that's on the other, other, other um, aspects of the intersection? So right now, the, on, the only uh, parking restrictions that are proposed are the two parking spaces uh, shown on those diagrams that are within, they're actually located within the intersection. Uh, and we felt that they were uh, limiting site, you know, sight lines and lines of, lines of sight, I should say, uh, within the intersection. So that is the reason those two uh, parking spaces will be uh, restricted. Are there any other intersections that are within two car lengths that, um, or two to three car lengths on any of the approaches um, to the intersection? Um, I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know that there are no other parking spaces in the immediate vicinity that we felt uh, would, would hamper the operation of the intersection or pose any sort of um, safety issue. I guess that, that would be one of my concerns with, with the, the proposal is, is the line of sight um, of the driver um, as far as, you know, I, I think that there would be a tendency of the driver to uh, a tendency of the drivers to continue to do a right turn on red um, and that it, they would really need to have not as much cars around the area. I know driving up Pearl Street, sometimes there tends to be um, some cars parked on the street in front of that uh, parking lot or near the edge of McDonald's and it may not make that sight line as clear as possible until you're almost at the intersection. And I, I think the drivers might need to have a little bit more warning um, that that there is a crosswalk there um, that's coming up. Okay, I can I can certainly, um, I, I, I believe I know which approach you're, you're speaking about. So the Han Pearl, Street, Pearl Street approach or Hancock Street approach? Uh, Pearl Street and Hancock Street actually. Um, because I, I just think that there, there are a lot of cars that, that crowd towards that intersection, obviously because of parking needs. 
And um, I think that, you know, when there's a lot of background stuff and cars that are there and, and then, you know, the light, the, uh, the signs are going to be changing. I, I think we have the best chance of adherence to the mm -hmm. parking or driving patterns if uh, the cars that are anywhere near that intersection on any approach are not allowed to park near that on the street. I think on Hancock, isn't it just, is, is, is the two lanes. So I don't think there's parking right next to it. There, so, there isn't parking right next to it, but. Um, he's got a couple of car lengths there, easy. But um, the other, Pearl Street is a different story, I agree. But um, we can take a look at that and see, see if there's any concerns for sure. He's an incredible individual. What was the price of this girl? But here's what I want to tell the viewers out there. John, in the chat box, I just put a study. Have you reviewed this study at all? It was done from 2005 to 2009 um, within a mile of the T, which included South Branch Street Square. The study showed in that time frame, six pedestrians were hit in the crosswalks there. Um, have you seen this? I have not. Okay. This was done by... Um, by um, Metropolitan Planning Organization um, because of the T location. Um, there were six pedestrians hit in that time frame. I know in the past couple of years, multiple more pedestrians have been hit with the current um, the current issue. I've watched two people hit there. Um, one was hit by somebody turning from Washington by Braintree Rug, turning the corner around Braintree Rug to Hancock, um, was hit right there on the crosswalk. And then there was another person hit on the other side by um, South Side um, and like Richmond's area um, in the crosswalk there. Um, he could not attend the meeting tonight or he would have. He doesn't own a smartphone. He doesn't have internet access. Um, he spent nine months in the hospital from his injuries um, and I watched it happen. And he again is another person with a disability. Well, thank you. I can, I can certainly, um, I, will, I will certainly take a look at that. At that I point. feel like what you really need is to hold an actual neighborhood meeting, but it can't be on Zoom because a lot of the people in this neighborhood don't have internet access because of poverty related to disability. Um, I mean, if there could be some sort of an outdoor meeting, telling people to show up at a certain time, social distancing, like over by yoga bar or something, you're going to get a lot more feedback from people with disabilities that don't have tech access. They don't have email access to send you an email, um, but they'll give you a lot of input because they're there all the time. It's one of those things you would have to flyer on the sign pulse. That's how they'll find out because of their lack of communication due to poverty related to disability. Um, yeah, we did send out flyers, but you know, obviously not related to the the, the in person one. But um, well, the Zoom meeting they couldn't do anything. They don't have internet. They can't join. Yeah. All so right, they well, know what's going on, but they're like, "What do we do?" Because we can't tell them our experiences. I don't, unfortunately, I don't, given the, um, you know, given the COVID-19 uh, outbreak, I just don't know if a, if an actual in-person meeting is, uh, is something that we're able to do at this time. Oh, if I may, is there an opportunity for persons to be able to email you comments and concerns or call you, call you with comments and concerns if they... <laughs> Absolutely. Are able to? Absolutely. Okay. What's the best number to reach you at, John? Uh, my, my direct line is 781-794-8013. Thank you. Okay. Um, at this point, um, I, I, I'm uh, thinking that we have we have given our, our comments in, um, and uh, and hopefully we'll be able to. If anybody has any other concerns, we'll be able to call the engineering department at that number and be able to um, to log our concerns. Um, I, I do believe that that uh, at this point we know that the the project is starting, but there there may be other things that can happen um, in order to make sure that 
uh, the, the best possible notification to everyone um, about the changes is happening and that we can modify, um, modify whatever uh, plans there are as far as parking places, signage, et cetera. Um, to try to make this as safe as possible, if not uh, be able to alter, um, we, we still have a little bit of time to be able to alter um, phasing, et cetera, uh, should that need arise or the engineering department determine that that need will arise. Um, so we're going to close this comment out uh, and move on to the Massachusetts Office on Disability Virtual Summit with Christina. Actually, if we can back up for a minute, Lynn, um, oh, sure. yeah. Mr. Thompson and Mr. Arsenal were also going to provide what update they may have on the shared streets grant. Oh, sorry about that. Absolutely. Sure. So um, ha have you folks um, heard or seen, see seen any materials relating to this? I just I'm trying to. So, John, no, they haven't. Um, we have advised the commission that through Beta Group, who the town contracted with to perform the analysis, that's kind of where we're at in the compilation of that material. So nothing has been released on the shared streets yet because I know that that was still all in process. Okay. Okay. So recently, uh, the Braintree D DPW applied for and received a, a grant through MassDOT. Um, the grant was uh, approximately $300,000. Uh, to make um, upgrades to, to, to various school zones around town. So there were six locations in total. Uh, that There were four elementary schools, Flaherty School, Hollis School, uh, Morrison School, and Highland School. And then also the two middle school locations, East Junior High and South Junior High. Uh, and so essentially what we're doing at each location is, uh, is upgrading uh, some of the some of the wheelchair ramps to AD, to meet ADA compliance. Uh, we're, we're trying to pick the main crossing areas uh, out in front of each school. So um, and then in addition to that, we're also installing high visibility, uh, high friction surface in the crosswalks. Uh, we chose the color blue just because that's the Braintree blue. Uh, we thought it would it was a good uh, it was a good choice, and um, and so. In front of those locations, you'll see new blue crosswalks uh, with ADA compliant wheelchair ramps. Uh, at the crosswalk locations, we're also installing uh, rapid rectangular rapid flashing beacons, which are uh, strobing, essentially push button strobing uh, warning lights uh, that alert drivers to uh, pedestrians trying to use the crosswalks. Uh, and then lastly, we're also installing new school zone signage at those locations as well um, that will you know establish the school zones they flash 20 miles per hour uh, during pickup and drop off times when kids are present uh, and those schools also school, school zone signs will off also incorporate a radar speed uh, speed indicator uh, so that cars you know driving through will uh, will be you know see their speed uh, and they'll know to slow down to meet you know, to meet those uh, school zone requirements. Thank you, John. Sure. Okay. Um, does anybody um, from the commission have any questions uh, concerning the um, shared streets grant update? No. Okay. Um, so we're going to move forward with the Massachusetts Office on Disability Virtual Summit with Christina. Uh, hi, everybody. That actually uh, got postponed the morning of the summit. They were having technical difficulties. So a new date hasn't been given yet. Um, so I'll attend it probably virtually whenever they reschedule it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, so the next on the update is finances with Mary Beth. Sure. I don't really have much to add from last month. Um, I did check with the town accountant and they have not been able to update um, the, the fine system as of today's date. So the, the balance that was remaining in the account from last month was $48,345.28. So I'm hoping that by next month they would have provided an update because they do all the updates to the system and I can update the commission more at the next. Okay. Um, and now the Sunset Lake Park update with Christina. 
So the, um, I spoke to um, John Morris from the engineering department um, before, I guess he apparently retired. I didn't realize. Um, no, not John Morris, I'm sorry. Paul, oh, Paul Smith. Yeah. So um, we were looking into um, rubber surfacing for the uh, Sunset Lake Park and the square foot the square footage of the Sunset Lake Park area only is uh, 2,560 square feet. And it's $30 a square foot for poor rubber surfacing. So it's about $76,000 in cost. So um, that's where we are. Stone dust is also the same per square footage. It's $30 per square foot. Um, not that we would fill the park with, with stone dust, you know, we would want a more accessible surface. Um, so that's that's where we are with that, with the cost. So we have the cost of, you know, the fence and uh, the cost for this. So these are just some numbers to think about. So um, Lynn and members of the commission at the meeting, at the last meeting, we had brought forward to you some information on the pathway. And what was discussed at the meeting was to also do some, have some consideration if you're going to consider the pathway surface and what it would cost, that consideration should also be given to the actual surface of the playground as well. So that's what Christina did was went and got some um, figures from the engineering department that speaks to the stone dust and or the, the other surface. Um, well, I guess, and I guess that shows why we need to consider doing this all in phases because the cost to be able to do any of this, given what the commission has, um, certainly is prohibitive to trying to do everything at once. Um, so that is um, that that is very good information to have to always be looking forward to the next step so that we can um, better make choices as far as what we want to do um, for um, the accessibility of the park. Right. Um, so if the commission was considering endorsing something, I would probably ask while Mr. Arsenal and Mr. Thompson are on, on the meeting that they give us some sort of a time frame as to right now we're heading into the late fall and winter season. And I don't really know what they can do surface wise now to be able to accommodate a pathway or something that the commission might be considering. But Jim and John could better weigh in on that so that the commission would have a better idea of what you'd be looking at time frame if you were considering endorsing, for example, a pathway or some other surface. Um, Chair Preston. Um, so um, yeah, we wouldn't be uh, at this time of year, everybody's kind of closing up shop. There's not a really lot of uh, ability to, to move forward with the right now. Right now. Um, so it would probably more than likely be, you know, April or May before a project should really get started. Um, well, in, on the one hand, you know, it, it gives a little more time to, to secure some funds and to sort of make a plan um, and, to, uh, and to think about the different surfaces that are available and, and, and the actual phasing kind of thing. Um, if we were to go ahead and change the accessibility path into the, the parkway, what kind of lead time would you need to be able to start something for April or May to be able to have it functional for the warmer months? Um, well, you'd, you'd have to have some type of plan showing what you want to do. It's, it's given, yeah, depending on the, it, it, depending on the size of the project, municipal government is, is difficult because you can't just call up a guy and say, hey, can you do this for me? And they get it done. You have to have plans, specifications, especially if it goes over 50, you know, a $50,000 mark, then you're talking, it has to be solicited, it has to go out for bids. Uh, low bidder has to be picked and selected. You have to look at all the documents. Um, it, I hate to say, but it could literally take a couple of months. So okay. it's 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 a timely in in you know it's it's just the way government works. Unfortunately, you know some good things go about government, some bad things about government. One of them is procuring takes a lot longer. Um, so the sooner you know, the sooner you guys have have, have an idea of what you want to do, the sooner you know we could try to help you with getting that process going, try to get contracts together and stuff like that and try to help you along the road. Um, so we have, we have no problem trying to help you out because we do a lot of it and I can work with Mary Beth to, to do that. Um, but it, it is, it is take some time, yes. 
Right. So Christina Zanidi is actively looking at for grants as well that might help with an opportunity like this. But I would suggest based on what Jim is saying that between now and the springtime that the commission consider what you would you would like to endorse and then pro possibly work with Jim to create a plan and then move forward from there. And we have some, you know, a few of the winter months that would be helpful in doing that and providing some sort of a proposal to him and see what could be done. Yeah, uh, I don't seem to find the raise 10 function on my iPad, but when you have time, I have a question. Uh, Penny, do you have, do you have a comment on, on the actual project that we're discussing? Yeah. Yes, yeah. my question is how's that, uh, come within the set the ADA settlement we have to make all the parks accessible. I'm oh. sorry, I couldn't make that out. Oh, Crystal and I were plaintiffs in a lawsuit. We have a settlement to make the parks accessible. Why, why are we talking about separate funding? The, the town is already committed to doing that in the settlement. I'm a little puzzled. Well, Penny, the town has committed, however, often the funding sources are going to come external anyway. It's not necessarily going to be all town funded. It could be grants and other funding sources. Okay, so that, that I know Crystal would know the answer. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so I guess um, what I want to know, uh, I think that probably what, well, if if people um, have a comment on this, I think probably what we should do is put on the agenda for December or January to actually um, get a, we'll get a, a plot layout of the actual park, determine which pathing that we want to go ahead and try to have done and sort of anticipate what we would like to have put down um, and potentially a surface that would coordinate with whatever path surface we, um, we decide to choose so that we can go ahead and, and um, have a definitive this is what we want in phase one so that we can then move forward and, and provide that for uh, for Jim and John. Does that sound like a um, like a feasible way to move forward? I feel it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, Crystal, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's feasible. Um, I feel like we also kind of need to think through some of the bigger picture, um, like where the paths are going to go and what we would want to add there in the near future um, to bring the equipment ratios into compliance. Um, that probably would be something we can, but I again, I think what we probably need to have in front of us is an actual plot plan of the, like, right. so that we can all visualize that space because we don't necessarily know what need to know specifically what type of equipment if we're limited in size or space for it anyway. We just need to know where the path would need to approach kind of thing um, so that we just can have a better visualization. I, I do agree we need to anticipate what we want to go get, but I think um, right now, phase one, we, we need to actually be able to get somebody into the park yeah. um, and, and then be able to move forward with, with other pieces of equipment. Um, two other issues around getting into the park. Um, there should also be um, a handicapped spot next to the walkway that we're putting in. Um, I don't think we've brought that up before, but the only handicapped parking is right in front of the beach. Um, and they're already short a handicapped spot at that lake anyway. Um, there should be a four, there's a total of three. Um, and so if they put one over there, then that would bring the compliance up and um, provide access for parking next to the playground. That's that's probably pretty easy to do yeah, relative to, to deciding yeah. what to do with the park. So um, I, I'd like to sort of focus on the, the pathway and the surface so that things that we would need to have a plan for to be able to present to another department is probably where we need to focus our efforts for um, for the meeting. Does that sound about yep. right? Yep. Okay, so um, Mary Beth, is there any possibility of in paperwork that gets sent out to us before the next meeting that we could have like a drawing of the of the uh, actual park and so we can sort of see where it is and, and just some some basic numbers as far as what the dimensions of it are, et cetera? Sure, we can connect with the engineering department to do that. Okay, that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll put that on as a as an item to as a as probably like a big discussion item um, that we have for next meeting um, to be able to focus on. 
Can I just add one more thing about um, Sunset Lake that we had previously discussed? What's up? Um, the, the accessible picnic table, again, is when I was over there a week or two ago, it's back in the sand, so there's no access to the accessible picnic table, and this keeps happening. They get moved around and they're putting the accessible ones in the middle of the beach, um, not near the pathways. So I'm, I'm not aware of it moving, so I don't I don't know. I'll I'll check on it if you want. Yep. No, okay. it was in the sand. It was there was no access to it. No, I'm saying it, I don't know why it would have been moved away. People from, move them. People move well, them to do whatever. Well, I'll find out what's going yep. on. Because I told them to move it to that location. So <laughs> I, um, I took a picture at the time. I'll look for the picture. I meant to send it to you to let you know, but I forgot until we just brought up the lake and the surfacing. Um, no problem. I'll find out what's up. Is there a way to actually lock down the accessible picnic table in an accessible spot so this doesn't become an issue, or do you move them in for the winter? I forget. I believe we do move them in, in the winter time. Actually, but if there was an established little lock or latch in the ground that a table leg just gets attached at one corner, um, that might deter people from moving into inaccessible areas. Oh, so you're thinking that people that come there to Yeah, the that's how this happens. Is oh, okay. We'll start moving equipment around, but okay. then we don't have access again. So it's one of those things that needs to be checked on a regular basis because um, okay. I've seen those tables moving around all summer. I'll find out what's, if there's a way we could lock it down somehow. I'll check yeah, on just, it. I don't think the others need to be so much. It's more of that specific accessible table where this happens a lot. Okay, sure. Fair enough. Great. Okay. Um, that is all that is officially on the agenda. Um, do does any um, other person on the on the committee have any other issues to bring up for this evening's um, Commission on Disabilities meeting? Yes, I wanted to submit an item for the agenda next month. What is it? Um, to consider funding some small portable ramps for businesses that have one single step um, that they could have inside their business um, for people that may need access where it's not feasible for them to install a ramp, like when the business is right in front of a sidewalk. A lot of businesses in Boston have them. Just a small portable ramp about four feet long. Okay, it can be placed on the agenda, but I, I will have to connect with our town solicitor because I don't believe you can use public funds for private good. So okay. I can follow up on that. Okay, that would be good to follow up on. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Mary, do you have any other issues? I, I don't have any, no. I'm okay, thank you. Um, so uh, we did have uh, we did have um, some public comments concerning the uh, concerning the, the road work um, and again on the uh, on the park. So um, at this point, um, I believe we've covered the items of the agenda. Um, can we have um, uh, do we have any uh, we, we don't have any other issues from members of the commission as far as bringing it up. Okay. Um, so I'm looking for a motion to adjourn the meeting. Um, should we open public comment in case there's anything else people want to bring up? Uh, I had not anticipated that since we had a significant portion for the road work. That was what I had had, uh, had um, that I, I, had, I really wanted to have the focus on if somebody had, had issues with that. And we did have a comment on the on the two items that we had on our agenda. So if we don't have any other issues that a member of the commission is bringing up at this point, I'd probably move to uh, to go ahead and adjourn meeting. I okay. I just want to make sure that Greg didn't have something to add. That was my concern. Well, let me ask Gregory, do you have any, um, any, any comments or concerns over anything that we've discussed this evening? I have not heard back yet from, um, from the mayor or anything about, about additional people being on the commission. So I don't have any information to put forth as far as that goes. I know you had mentioned that at the last meeting, um, but if you have any other comments um, concerning anything that we have, um, 
please feel free to, to, to make those comments at this time. We're all set. Oh wait, Greg is asking in the chat box, what what, what is the email, email address? address? Greg, are uh, you the looking just for the engineering department? Are you are you looking for Jim and um John's emails? If Greg would like to email me, I can forward it to whomever it may need to go to. Okay. Okay. I could, I'll email you, Greg. Greg, I can send you an email tomorrow morning and you can just tap off of that and email me back. Okay. Um, any other any other questions, Greg, or comments? Okay, great. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay, so um, so I'm looking for um, a motion to adjourn the meeting from November two. I'll make a motion, Crystal. And do I have a second? Second. Okay. Um, all in favor will take a verbal check. Mary, do you are you uh, are in agreement? I am. Thank you. And Crystal, are you in agreement? I am. And Lynn Valancourt in agreement. We have a motion to adjourn, and the Commission on Disabilities meeting is now closed for November second. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. You, thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks.
Hi, Vera. Hi. Open up. Open your mouth. Get some water. Get some water. 